When we think of crime and punishment in the medieval period, we often think of a chaotic system of judgement and brutal punishments that seem out of proportion with the seriousness of the crime. In medieval Europe, law and order was harsh. It was assumed that people would only behave well if they feared the penalty of breaking the law. There was a gibbet on the outskirts of most towns in England. There, criminals would be hanged, their bodies left to rot for many weeks, as a stark warning as to the reality of breaking the law. However, this obviously wasn't the great deterrent that the establishment hoped it would be. In just one year, the northern city of Lincoln had 114 murders, 89 robberies with violence, and 65 woundings. Considering Lincoln had a population of just 7,000 people in 1202, those numbers seem quite high. And when you also consider that only two people were executed for these crimes, it would seem that a lot of medievals were getting away with their offences. Let's travel back in time and have a look at the life of a criminal in the Middle Ages. Welcome to Medieval Madness. Blasphemy. In medieval Europe, the Catholic Church was a dominant force, and many countries maintained order by imposing religious or canon laws on the people, as well as those decided by the monarch. Refusing to acknowledge God or offering up any ideas not sanctioned by the church was considered to be blasphemous. The Dominican friar and philosopher Thomas Aquinas amazingly considered blasphemy, quote, a sin more grave than murder, because it was directed against God rather than against one's neighbour. This view was also considered true by the medieval leaders of Islam too. In Kuwait, punishment was as brutal as it could get, with stoning, burning at the stake, or having an elephant crush your head being the standard penalty. Across medieval Europe, there were many terrible punishments for the offence, including garroting in Spain, mutilation in Germany, and flogging or branding in England. Unfortunately, it was very easy to commit the sin of blasphemy. Just a tiny slip in the company of the wrong person could result in someone suddenly becoming an unwitting criminal. Murder Why the Middle Ages in Europe was so violent has often been debated. Historians have argued that almost everyone had witnessed a murder or knew someone who had been killed. It's claimed that in the Oxford or London of the medievals, you were more likely to be murdered than die by accident. Getting away from the scene of the crime after a murder was quite easy. There were large areas of woodland and countryside between urban settlements in medieval Europe, giving the perpetrator the perfect opportunity to flee the scene, and the chances of getting caught were small. Law enforcement was practically non-existent, although some Italian city-states were lucky enough to have salaried police officers. Theft. The medievals stole for many reason, just as people do so today. Theft was probably one of the most common crimes committed during the Middle Ages. Just like murderers, the medieval thief could easily slip away unnoticed. How crimes were perceived and the severity of the punishment given seemed to depend on where the offence was committed. In 1353, in the village of Mihavel, southern France, a woman was washing her clothes in the local stream. Leaving the items to dry on a frame, she returned to find that her cloak had been stolen. A young man of 15 was arrested for the crime a few days later. He was found guilty of the theft at court, and he was banished from the village for three months. In the London of 1417, a man named Edmund H. Chapel from the district of Finsbury was indicted for the robbery of a horse, four bolts of cloth, and some other goods. He was found guilty by a jury and sentenced to hang. The crimes are quite similar, but the punishments are worlds apart. It would seem that there were huge variations in what penalties were deemed appropriate depending on the location. In 1321, the Warrant family were making a nuisance of themselves in the rural village of Saul, in Norfolk, England. Firstly, three of the siblings, sisters Marjorie and Matilda, along with brother Richard, were accused of stealing goods. They managed to evade punishment along with another sister who was accused of theft later in the same year. 
However, a fifth family member named John was found guilty of stealing clothes and other goods worth eight shillings from a neighbour. At a time when the average labourer was earning three pennies a day, eight shillings was worth, on average, a month's wages. It would seem that the Warrants were making a considerable living from their illegal activities. Unfortunately, stealing anything worth over 12 pence was seen as a serious crime, and John was hanged. Undeterred by the fate of their relative, the Warrants were back in trouble with the law again in 1325. This time, all four of the siblings were behind bars to await trial for stealing cloth worth 60 shillings, and the jailer was specifically instructed to inflict them with fort et dur, or strong and hard treatment, which probably meant some form of torture. But working together again, they managed to escape conviction when put before a jury. The following year, they were at it again. In February, the family were indicted for the theft of 32 cloths, and in August, the two sisters were accused of stealing another 40 shillings worth. They were all acquitted on both occasions. There is no way of knowing how many other crimes the family committed, or how they kept getting away with it when they were brought before a court. We can only assume that they either gave up their life of crime, or were never caught again, because they disappeared into the mists of medieval obscurity. It is surprising that the family was never actually convicted of any crimes, especially when we consider that the guilt of a suspect on trial in the Middle Ages was usually dependent on the reputation and character of the prisoner, rather than evidence. Trials were very quick affairs, without the lengthy questioning of witnesses and drawn-out deliberations that we see today. Corruption in 1249, some merchants from the Belgian provenance of Brabant complained to King Henry III that they had been robbed whilst conducting business in the county of Hampshire. Hampshire was a busy, thriving place, being home to the port of Southampton and the Palace of Winchester. The suspects were caught, put on trial, but acquitted. However, the merchants persisted in their complaint. King Henry took instruction from his councillors and was not happy to find that attacks on travellers were common in Hampshire and there was a conspiracy to hide the crime from the justices, which involved jurors who were actually accomplices of the robbers. It seems that corruption was a huge problem, and many gangs had links to the rich and powerful, including knights and members of the nobility. The dishonesty went right to the very top. In 1350, Sir William Thorpe, the Chief Justice of the King's Bench, was jailed for accepting bribes. Perhaps this is why the Warrants were never convicted, and why jury after jury found them innocent, despite their previous form and bad reputation. It's possible that they were involved in a conspiracy, and sharing their stolen money with the very jurors who were deciding their fate. Finding Sanctuary of course, if you were a convicted criminal and you could make it to a church, you could always claim sanctuary. In medieval Europe, the most common crimes for which a fugitive would seek sanctuary were theft and murder. Once the outlaw was inside a cathedral or church, they were safe, as their pursuers were forbidden to enter by law. The felon could even take a bow and arrow, or any other weapon, into the church to attack their pursuers from the windows. Once safe inside, the hope was that an agreement might be reached with the injured party and the offender would be given safe passage to leave. Unlike most European churches where a person could only stay in sanctuary for 40 days, for the English, there was no limit. In 12th century England, anyone claiming sanctuary had to go into permanent exile from their country and could only return if given a royal pardon. Sanctuary followed by exile was better than going to prison. The food inside jail was bad and scarce, and disease was rife. Not many made it out alive. There were severe penalties for anyone who broke the laws of sanctuary. In 1284, Ralph of Aldgate was out walking with his mistress, Alice at Bow, when a goldsmith named Lawrence Duquette insulted her and called her a fallen woman. Ouch. The two men began to fight, and Ralph was badly injured. Fearing that he would die, Lawrence fled to the church of St. Mary Le Beau, nearby. 
Ralph actually survived, but Lawrence was later found hanging inside the church. Believing he had committed suicide because of guilt, his body was cut down and he was thrown into a ditch to rot. But a witness came forward who was hiding inside the church and had seen Alice and a group of Ralph's friends enter St. Mary's and lynch Lawrence, hanging him from one of the mullions above a window. This was clearly a violation of the conditions of sanctuary, and the perpetrators were punished accordingly. Alice was burnt at the stake, which was the usual method of execution for a murderess, and her 15 male co-conspirators were hanged. Self-killing The body of poor Lawrence was treated with such contempt because the act of suicide was also seen as a crime. From as early as the 6th century, the Catholic Church viewed it as a form of murder and denied a suicide victim their formal funeral rite. By the 12th century, this so-called self-murder was seen as a crime in civil law as well as in religious law in Europe, because it deprived a feudal lord of one of his chattels. The victim's property and belongings would be confiscated for the king's treasury instead of being given to the suicide's family. In early 15th century France, the law called for the house of a suicide victim to be demolished, his fields burned, and his woods chopped down. As if that wasn't enough, the body of a suicide victim who was seen as nothing but a common criminal would often be tortured. Some would be hanged or dragged through the streets by a horse, and others burned as a warning of the absolute atrocity of self-murder. In England, a suicide was buried at the crossroads with a stake through the heart to pin the corpse to the ground. Bizarrely, it was thought that this would prevent the spirit from returning and causing any more mayhem. If the staking failed to hold the soul, then it would hopefully get confused by the crossroads and choose the wrong road, thereby going off to harass some other village or town. The actual amount of unlawful behaviour that occurred during the Middle Ages is hard to calculate, but as many social mischiefs were also criminalised, such as gambling, scolding, vagrancy, sexual offences, and even eavesdropping, it would seem to be a time when both church and state were trying to gain social control over even the tiniest of wrongdoings. Thank you for watching this episode of Medieval Madness. If you have just committed a crime, please hand yourself in at the local police station and do not go to your local church. Although, please do subscribe to the channel before doing so. Cheers!